fun. It's exciting, and more importantly, it's very social. The Cube does an Live from Midtown Manhattan, The Cube's live coverage of Big Data NYC, a Silicon Angle Wikibon production. Made possible by Hortonworks, We Do Hadoop, and Wham Disco. Hadoop made invincible. And now your co-hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon with Jeff Kelly, and we're here live at Big Data NYC. We're at the Warwick Hotel right across the street from the Hilton on 6th Ave. We've been here <clears throat> going wall to wall uh, all day. We'll be here tomorrow. We were here last night. So Jeff and I are really excited about this segment. We've been tracking uh, uh, Wan Disco for quite some time now. Brett Rudenstein is the product guy for Nonstop Hadoop, which is really when, when Disco's claim to fame. So, Brett, welcome to theCUBE. Good Thank to see you. you. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, let's get into it. You know, we were talking to some of your colleagues uh, earlier about you know, what it is you guys do, so I think we got that down. But talk about the product specifically that, that you run. Yeah, so Windows goes nonstop Hadoop essentially provides active active replication for name node, which essentially eliminates name node bottlenecking, it eliminates the single point of failure for name node, and it allows clients to essentially round robin their requests to each one of the active name nodes such that you also get a name node load balancing effect as well. Uh, so over the wide area network, we allow Hadoop to span geographic locations in a single Hadoop. So what that effectively means is you have one Hadoop cluster, a single cluster ID that spans n number of geographic territories. Okay, so that's a pretty complicated situation for a lot of people in the audience. So talk about name node. What, what's a name node do? What's the purpose of a name node? Yeah, the name node essentially is, uh, uh, or, or the purpose of name node is to basically store the file system metadata. So if you think about a standard disk drive, uh, there's a, a placeholder, if you will, to know where all the files live on that disk drive. Now Hadoop is a distributed architecture. So the name node basically handles all of the metadata information for where all the files live in the Hadoop cluster. So the name node allows you to get to the data. It knows where Correct. the data is. You lose the name node, you're screwed. Exactly. Basically. And it's, it's <laughs> another piece of is, what you guys do. Is that the official way we <laughs> yeah. put it? <laughs> that's, that's a technical term. Yeah. Right. Now, so, and the other piece of it is, is, as you said, Hadoop's a distributed file system, so the data is everywhere. Right? It's, yeah, and it's so the, and the name node keeps track of those locations so that, uh, so that a client that uh, makes a request knows, it knows where to go get that data from. So when you say active, active, yeah. um, talk about what that means. Yeah, so, you know, and we look at it from two angles. One is from the name node perspective. So uh, active, active means that a client could hit, uh, in fact, a single client will send a request to one name node, that uh, request would be handled by that name node, and then the follow-on request might land on another name node. So in a standby situation, all client requests would only go to a single name node. And only in the event of a failure would you, would you switch over or fail over to that standby. In an active, active environment, the clients round robin their request to each name node. So you get a load balancing effect against that name node such that you don't create a bottleneck. You know, we've seen where name nodes will go into garbage collection, you know, with these large Java heaps. Name node goes into garbage collection and causes a slowdown and complete pause of service. With multiple active name nodes, because you're not limited to, ju to the just one, you're able to continue service and operation in the cluster without any downtime, without any interruption. So in a, an active passive situation, or what you call the standby situation, if there's a failure, you fail over to that, that, that passive name node, which then becomes active, which of course takes time. Correct. And you've, like you said, you've got to constantly rebalance to make sure that you've got you know, a situation under control. So you've got, in a, uh, uh, you've essentially got a, a, a virtual single point of control with your solution, is that right? Yeah, in fact, well, you know, if you really look at our architecture, we call it a share nothing architecture because no one of the 101 name node acts as that central coordinator. There isn't one machine that creates a leadership role. Uh, whereas you look at some of the other protocols out there, they even if it's a temporary election to that role, it is a leadership role, and in the event of a failure, you hope that some other machine self-elects in its place. In a share nothing architecture, with no single point of failure, you always ensure a consistency and continuous availability. So this would be what Abby Meta calls an AC product, that's after cutting. <laughs> as opposed to a BC before cutting. So you guys designed this for Hadoop, obviously. 
Okay, uh, so take us through the, the demo. What do you, what do, what do yeah, we do? and just before I do, you know, so we've, we've talked about, you know, multiple active name nodes. What we do across a wide area network is we do stand up that single HDFS, and it allows you to ingest data in both sites, both the data site A and the data site B, or, and it could be even, you know, a, a third site, a fourth site, and so forth. The demonstration that I'm going to do today is going to use some of the standard sample applications that ship with Hadoop. So I'm going to run TerraGen and TerraSort in data center one. And if we have time, we'll run TerraValidate in data center number two to prove that the, day made its way uh, that the data made its way across the WAN. Now, if you look at the screen here. Sorry to interrupt. You're saying you could do this through N, N data centers. Right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes. If you, if you look at the screen here, you see a, a map is sort of a, a live view of the active data centers, and we have two data centers. There's a data center in Northern Virginia. It's data center one. These are running up in Amazon EC2, so this is a live clustered environment. So data center one is in Northern Virginia. Data center number two is in EC2 West in Oregon. So uh, about 3,000 miles difference between the two data centers. So I'm going to drill down on, on, the, uh, on the WAN link here, if you will, and that'll give us an exposed view of what's happening operationally inside the data center. So again, I've got the three name nodes that I talked about, three active name nodes, and there's actually three data nodes there as well, a six-node cluster in Northern Virginia, and then three more data nodes in Oregon. Uh, and the graphing application that you're seeing is showing the RPC bytes in and the RPC bytes out for each of the active name nodes. So let's go ahead and start our TerraGen application. So we're going to run a little script here. In the script, we're going to put it in a directory called SA. And when we run the script, one of the first things that you'll notice on screen is that the name nodes start responding to the request. So you've seen each one of these name nodes respond to the request for client activity. So we're already kind of sort of demonstrating that load balancing effect that you see. Each one of the name nodes is responding to the client requests. One of the other things that you'll start to see is over in data center number two in Oregon, you're seeing these little blue bars appear. What these blue bars are is they're showing you something called foreign blocks. So because we've made Hadoop data center aware, all of the blocks that are uh, being ingested into data center one happen in a, in a synchronous fashion, but the foreign blocks move asynchronously. So we don't block the client. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start to Sorry to interrupt you. I just yeah. just talked to our director. We're having a slight technical problem. So why don't we? We're going to hold on the demo just for a moment. Um, so why don't we jump in just for a second? Ask a little bit about uh, you know kind of the. Let's talk a little bit about the applications this allows you to really run. What are some of the things that um, w if we can really talk about the business values? So so if you're an enterprise and you're looking at this solution, you're looking at to do what is this really going to allow you to do that maybe you couldn't do before. Yeah, I mean, if there's, there's a number of things. Let me start with, you know, sort of, you know, contrasting it to some of the, you know, other methodologies that people use today to kind of create or keep data in sync across multiple Hadoops. So the first is that it's two different clusters. Uh, you've got uh, two different clusters that you, you're keeping in sync, and usually the two most popular methodologies are one is you use DISCP, or something controlling disk CP on the back end to periodically send out that synchronization, if you will. But the problems that we see is that disk CP won't copy a file if it's the same size and the same name as its predecessor. So how often does that actually happen? Mm. Well, interestingly enough, if you're doing job transformations, you've got the same data inputs, and they, that data input might be growing, but the data that you're creating tends to be you know, file part 001, file part 002, split points are about the same. So after a period of a couple of months, you wind up having your cluster sort of diverge. Now it's a manual operation to have those two clusters or to have these sysadmins basically figure out what diverged. And another thing to sort of mention is DCP runs as MapReduce. Mm -hmm. So you're actually using up various cluster resources to use it, and then of course comparing, when, you, when, you, when those two data centers start to diverge, comparing the two of those can use up all the cluster resources as well, essentially leaving you out of service. Not to mention the human the uh, human element, right? How do they? How how does a sysadmin actually when we'll describe the process that a sysadmin has to go to sort of? Well, a sysadmin is essentially has to has to ensure, or they have to check and, and run sums against each cluster individually and make sure that the files are essentially lining up. And and when they don't, they then need to also involve the user community and say, I have two copies of your file. You know, which one do I keep and which one do I throw away? So now the users are totally ticked off, right? Because you're First of all, you've advertised to them that you know you really don't have your IT act together. Secondly, you're asking them to stop selling for hey, stop selling. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I need your help to figure out which one of your files we should keep. 
Right, yeah, so that's and, a real backlash. And there's a similar problem with uh, doing parallel data ingest. You know, a hiccup in either Hadoop, you know, if you're using Flume or even a load balancer, uh, using Flume, Scoop, or, or some technology to kind of keep two different Hadoops in synchronization, uh, those are problematic as well. So those are just sort of the admin problems. Now, when we talk about the use cases that we solve, uh, from a use case perspective, one is, you know, failing over to a disaster recovery site. We use that word before active, active. Both sites are active. You can ingest data into both sites. You can run jobs on both sites. So if one data center is down, what is the length of time that you have to go through in order to get that site back up online? And with the Wendisco's nonstop Hadoop, it's essentially zero. You can just start running jobs in the data center that remains. Awesome. So. Okay, now um, we were talking to Jagain earlier about some, you were, you were just mentioning some other sort of competitive approaches. Um, what else is out there in the marketplace like this? Like uh, a nonstop Hadoop? Yeah. Uh, there really isn't anything because no other technology stands up a single HDFS that spans multiple data, uh, data centers. Okay, so you stand alone in that regard. So how does this differ, for instance, from something like Name Node Federation? So we've heard a little bit about that from some of the other players. Yeah, Name Node Federation is interesting, but what it does is it's a, you're effectively you know, separating the namespace. And what that means is you're saying, you know, uh, conceptually anyway, you know, I'm going to serve A through L on this name node. You know, all the, all the A through L mm -hmm. files, that's not quite how it works, <laughs> but conceptually, A through L will be served here and M through Z will be served on this name okay. node. So if a name node fails, you're kind of back in the original position, which is you can't service the part of the name node that failed. Again, with the active active architecture, you're able to maintain uh, continuous availability. You don't really need federation. Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. So I think we've got our technical difficulties solved, so we're going to jump back into that demo. Um, why don't we just, if it's okay with you, could we, if we could start at the beginning? Yeah, take, take the demo from the top. Yeah, I think that, right. would be, that would be great. So um, you've got uh, two EC2 instances, right? Different, different zones, right? Correct. So two EC2 instances, one in Amazon EC2 East and one in EC2 West. So Northern Virginia and Oregon. So what we're going to do is we're going to run some of the standard sample applications. We're going to run TerraGen and TerraSort in Data Center 1. Okay. And then to prove that all the data migrated its way between the two data centers, we're going to run Terra Validate over in Data Center number 2. Along the way, what we're going to do is we're going to throw a bunch of various failure scenarios. We'll fail a local name node. We'll fail a remote name node. And at some point, we'll even crash the entire WAN link. Pull and a still plug or two. <laughs> yeah. pull, a, pull, pull a plug or two and crash the entire WAN link. So let's start that off. I'm going to do a gen. So this is our little script that runs TerraGen and Terra Validate. We'll put it in directory SA2. So this is just the directory where the output files are going to go into. And again, zooming back in on the, uh, the internals of this cluster, you see the three name nodes start to respond to the events. So basically, TerraGen is putting a bunch of information into HDFS. Mm -hmm. Sort will put it into a total order. And we see all the name nodes responding. Uh, and of course, over here in Data Center 2 in, in Oregon, we see these foreign blocks. So a foreign block is a block that is not yet replicated from the site of origin. Uh, in other words, we're putting data in Data Center 1, everything is fine there. We asynchronously transmit the foreign blocks so that they don't block the current client while they replicate to Data Center number 2. Now let's throw some failures at this. I'm going to SSH into uh, Data Center 1's name node, uh, let's pick, I don't know, C and I'm going to issue a reboot command. So what I've just done is I've rebooted this bottom machine here. In just a moment, the graphing application will update, and you'll see it flatline. So Make sure I understand. So you've done that while you've got data in flight. Data is in flight, correct. Yeah. And so, so it's like refueling a plane in, uh, in midair. Correct. OK. So now while we still have our job running, I'm going to also Kill a, jo uh, kill a name node in data center number two's name node C. So effectively what's happened here, let me set over to data center number two. We'll do data center number two's name node C as well, so it's in the same place in the screen, is while we're running our local ingest, I'm also got those blocks that are replicating from data center one to data center number two. I've killed the second one, so this one is down as well, and yet we're still replicating those blocks. So there's been no interruption of service on the client side. So the next thing that we're going to take a look at is that whole self-healing aspect that we talked about. So let's jump back one screen while we're replicating here. 
And one of the things that you'll see about the graphing application is one of the, the, the dots on the screen is turned blue. It's basically indicating that we're still providing service. It would have turned red if there was no service, but we're still providing service, but there's at least one name node down. And you see it's a blue dot on each side in both Virginia and Oregon. Yet a MapReduce job is still running. In fact, we're in the sort phase at this particular uh, point in time. And in just a few moments, what you'll see is the first name node that I rebooted will come back online. So it'll turn green. What's really happening under the covers, because we have a global sequence of operations, is the name node will come up in safe mode. Now, while it's in safe mode, it won't take any service requests. So clients will only work with the other name nodes that are available. It will learn from the other name nodes that it's behind in the global sequence. And then once it's completed that global sequence uh, or caught up, it will become an active participant in the cluster. And as you can see from the screen now, each one of these is now back online. If I drill back into it, you'll see that they're servicing client requests again. And each one of those name nodes is coming online again. Mm -hmm. And our job is just finished as well. Now we'll throw one, kind, one more failure at it. I'm gonna, run the, uh, I'm gonna run the application one more time. And the failure that we're going to throw at it this time is a complete WAN separation. So I'm going to break the WAN link between the two environments. So let's go over here. And uh, I'm just going to close the tunnel between the two by uh, issuing an IPsec stop. So let's, I'm going to give that another moment. Maybe we give it a few, uh, you know, a chance to replicate some of the blocks, but not all of them. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll shut it down. OK, great. Raising the bar <laughs> <laughs> on the demo. <laughs> and we're looking at a live demo here, right? This is a live demo running again in, uh, in two uh, clusters running up in Amazon EC2 East region and West region. So about 3,000 miles difference between the two. So let's go ahead and stop the, uh, okay. stop the tunnel between the two of those. What you're going to see now is you'll see each of the name nodes. It looks like they're down. They're not really down. They're still running in their respective data center, but the client no longer can see it. This application, this graphing application, can no longer see it. And for a visual perspective, if I go back to the on-screen map, uh, what you'll see in just a moment once it, uh, once it comes back in the, uh, the screen updates, you will see that it turns red, indicating that there's no service between the two. But if you look at our, our MapReduce job in, up in the upper right-hand corner, it's still running. It is still completing transactions, and it's queuing up those foreign blocks that need to cross the, uh, the wide area network. So the last part of the demonstration that I'll do for you here today is I'll bring that tunnel back up. We'll do an IPsec start. In just a moment, you'll see the line turn green, and then we'll continue with block replication and have complete uh, synchronicity across the two uh, clusters. Because remember, while it's two data centers, it is a single HDFS across one uh, or across the LAN or WAN. Uh, Brett, yeah, uh, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not uh, not trivial what, what you guys just showed all the all the tech behind there. But I wonder if you could compare this uh, to other sort of techniques to 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 provide resiliency to data. Uh, for instance, I'm thinking about things like bit slicing and people using Reed Solomon code uh, to essentially, you know, if you lose. Uh, a slice or two slices or three slices, you can recreate the data. How does this compare? Well, this is, this is really uh, uh, you know, a way of doing coordinated synchronization. So it's not like a, you know, even like a, a block device, synchroniz uh, device synchronization technology like in the MCS RDF. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those you know, technologies are technically limited. Typically, the latency is a big factor in those technologies. And so you only have a, a land distance uh, of about you know, 100, you know, 200 miles or so, plus or minus. Uh, with this technology, it's time independent, it's uh, WAN independent, and it's completely software based. There's no hardware that's involved in it. And it's that, as I mentioned earlier in, in, in the discussion, it's a share nothing architecture. There is no central coordination that if that machine is down, you have to wait to elect a new leader. Okay, and you do this through a pa the Paxos algorithm, right? It is, it is a patented implementation of okay. Paxos uh, that is able to cra cross those geographic boundaries, those geographic mm -hmm. distances. Juiced up uh, Paxos, <laughs> all right, great. Juiced up Paxos, I like <laughs> well, that. It strikes me as it must, be, it must be fun to develop this product because every day you're saying, well, let's try a new way we can try to break this, uh, uh, throw a new problem at it and, and, and stay one step ahead of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, the you know some of the first early on tests is you know we would you know basically reboot na name mm -hmm. nodes and we'd bring them back and then someone threw you know let's try a network partition where you know A can talk to B and A 
can talk to C, mm -hmm. but B and C can't talk to each other. And that Paxos algorithm, that patented Paxos, handles all those conditions whereby any network condition that you can throw at it, you know, just short of you know no availability, mm -hmm. will keep consistency and, and availability across the network. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, Brett, we're getting the hook. Thanks very much for, yeah, for the pleasure. demo, and uh, appreciate you coming on the Cube and Thank going deep with us. Yeah. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is the Cube. We're live from Big Data NYC. Right back. <laughs>